So we've got a real treat for you tonight. Double bill, um, a five minute introduction followed by the main event, which is on mixed streets. So the, 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 the five minute introduction is really just to, um, to launch a report, this report, um, which uh, myself and uh, Valentina Giordano, sitting here at the front, stand up, Valentina, uh, have been working on at, uh, at UCL. And just to briefly say a little something about it, um, and you may remember, or you may not remember, that a long, long time ago, uh, in the days of uh, John Prescott, uh, design codes suddenly came on the agenda. And we were all very interested uh, in the potential of design codes back in 2004. Um, and there was a National Design Codes pilot program that was launched uh, to test the use and utility of design codes across the country to deliver greater certainty, speed, and quality in the volume housing sector. And at that time, we were very concerned about the great expansion that was required in housing, particularly in the southeast, and we were looking at code as a way of improving the quality of, of design. And for those of you who don't know anything about design codes, what are they? Well, you could describe them as pieces of design guidance, um, usually for large areas or large sites or parts of cities, um, where the whole is coded into its parts. And then you can put those parts together in a multitude of different ways to create different places. Um, so that's really all they are. And they, they deal with these types of issues. And they usually are used to support some sort of spatial vision in the form of a master plan or, 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 or so forth. So that's what design codes are, a particular form of design guidance. And certainly when the, uh, the pilot program was launched, this was the uh, sort of reaction in the press that design codes were going to suffocate creativity. They were excessively bureaucratic. They only were concerned with traditional design aimed at cost-cutting, very restrictive and prescriptive, and they promoting formulaic design. So this was the immediate reaction, particularly in the architectural press at the time, back in uh, 2004. And the, the, the pilot program was launched, and at UCL we monitored the process and, and, and did the sort of research that went by the side of it. And there were seven pilot uh, po uh, projects dotted around the country, and those uh, we also looked at several other coding schemes that were much uh, further advanced, uh, again dotted around the country, and a few schemes that weren't design codes as well. Um, and the overarching conclusions, which you can't see there, I could see on my computer at home, I can't even read on this computer here. Uh, that's the problem when you go from a Mac to a PC, that things like that happen. But the, the, uh, the overarching conclusion was that design codes are useful, but they're, only, they're useful for particular types of sites, generally very large sites, sites in multiple ownership, which are going to be built out through successive phases over a period of time. Um, and they're useful because they inject a sort of an essential urban framework, which can then help to achieve some sort of consistency over time and deliver the sort of essential urban uh, elements and some of the most interesting and influential schemes of the last uh, 20 years or so have used design codes of various types and descriptions and they also we found they're quite useful in getting the different members of the design team together at the start of the process to talk about their aspirations and to agree their aspirations so we found through the pilot program that design codes were valuable and they were adopted into government policy in PPS3, which is now no more. But interestingly, there is still a mention of the importance and the value of design codes in the latest uh, national planning policy framework. So still being promoted by government uh, as an important policy tool. And we thought, well, did they live happily ever after? Are they delivering the sort of value that... Uh, the pilot program suggested they would uh, or not. And so this was just a very short little project designed to review that 
um, and to talk to the people that were using design codes to get a sense of, well, have they delivered on the initial promise? And we, it was based on a national survey, already two national surveys of local planning authorities uh, and urban design consultants uh, last summer. And uh, very quickly, what did we find? Uh, well, we found that actually there is uh, an incredible spread of the use of design codes, much more than I, than I thought there would have been. Um, 40 or so percent of local planning authorities in one way or another have used, desi have used design codes. They've even, either commissioned them or had them submitted as part of a planning uh, uh, application or produced them themselves. Um, so quite widespread. Uh, about a quarter of local authorities advocate the use of codes in their own policy. Uh, and two-thirds of urban design consultancies have experience in actually producing design codes. And you can see that consistently, with a, consistently with a little blip uh, around 2008, 2009, consistently the use of design codes has uh, increased over that period. So the use of design codes has very much become mainstreamed, or is in the process of becoming mainstreamed over that period. And interestingly, a lot of this is driven by developers and, and landowners who are submitting unsolicited design codes as part of their planning applications for developments, which I think was an interesting uh, finding. What are the benefits? Um, well, pretty much revisiting the, uh, the issue of design codes confirmed many of the earlier uh, uh, much of the early analysis that essentially design codes are about tying down the must-have urban elements, the urban DNA, if you like, of the scheme um, to ensure that there is this consistency over time as schemes are built out over 10, 15, 20 years, which is, uh, of course, the period of some of our largest uh, residential schemes. And uh, in this process, they have been very useful in offering greater certainty of outcomes and greater certainty of process, in particular, to developers, which is perhaps why developers themselves are very often using and promoting design codes themselves. Uh, they, we also found that they help to bring stakeholders together, uh, again, early on in the process, uh, and even that they can speed up the planning process, uh, at least the reserve matters part of the planning process. So although they take a long time at the start to agree and design, further down the line, when you're thinking about a large long-term development, there is a potential benefit in speed, which the previous government would have been very happy about because that was the, one of the main things they were interested in finding out. Do design codes lead to a faster uh, planning process or not? Fundamentally, therefore, the reasons were more or less the same, that our latest findings, they deliver better outcomes through a more coordinated design process. And uh, what support exists for design codes? Um, well, one interesting finding was that 93% of those who have used design codes uh, in our survey in our two surveys, found that uh, they were very positive about their use and, and would use them again uh, if the right circumstances uh, arose, uh, namely very large sites. Um, and consultants who hadn't used them were keen to use design codes and to acquaint themselves with the use of design codes. Um, and planning authorities were particularly particularly welcomed the use of design codes as they saw them as a way of in, uh, increasing their control on the sort of volume house building sector. Uh, and they found them very useful in that respect. Uh, and so just to conclude, um, despite all their potential positive benefits that we found and which confirmed, if you liked, the earlier research, um, practitioner, practitioners nevertheless remain aware that they have limitations. Um, codes alone cannot, of course, change the entire design and development system and, and practice. Um, and codes is just one part of a greater culture change uh, that has certainly started to happen and is continuing to happen, and codes are part of that. But some things never change. There's always some conflict. And uh, we can leave the last word to one of the respondents, 
who uh, really pointed out that codes um, have uh, the benefit, if you like, different types of benefit for different types uh, of, of, of users. Um, and, but there will always, eventually, also still be tensions within this process. So that is our little launch of that. As I said, just a five-minute launch of our, uh, uh, of our report. And if anybody's interested in seeing uh, the detail, then if you go to the, um, uh, the Urban Design Group uh, website, then you can download uh, the full exciting report from uh, the publications page of, of the Urban Design Group. Okay, with no further ado, let's move on to the main event, which is the focus on streets and mixed streets.